Well, with us is Elizabeth Pearson, who's an astrophysicist uh, with the St uh, Sky at Night magazine as well. Welcome. Now, just explain to us, and you must have had a moment yourself. We saw the, si si the, ast the other astrophysicists there gleaming as they saw those first images. Just that moment you first saw those images. It was it was really a, a special moment. I mean, we've had uh, one, the, the colour image has been around for a couple of days, but when that real up-close picture came out yesterday afternoon, when you could look and you could see the mountains of Pluto, it was really, it was such a special moment. You know, I've been waiting years for this. The, the people who have been working on this mission have been working on it for 30 years and finally we've got those images. It's a lifetime, it's a career essentially, isn't it? Yes. For some people. There's, there's some people who they've been working, um, they worked on the Voyager missions and now they finally feel that they've managed to complete the job that they started because they've actually managed to get these images of Pluto. Now, looking at this now, you, I imagine, see something completely different to what we would see as novices. <laughs> T tell us what you see with that image. So, at the moment, what we can see here is we can see some mountains across um, the, the vista of Pluto. And this is actually quite surprising because what they're not seeing is craters, which means that the surface must be quite young. Something's rejuvenating it. Um, and we're not entirely sure how that's happening, because on the planet Earth and some other planets in the solar system, other bodies in the solar system, that happens through volcanism. Um, but Pluto's too old. It's too cold. That should, it should have solidified by now. Sorry, volcanism. Volcanism. So, um, you know, on the Earth we have, we have a, a liquid core, magma, that flows up, it, it erupts from volcanoes and recovers the surface every couple of millennia, um, a million years. And... That doesn't happen on these very cold worlds because they've, they've just become a solid lump of rock and ice. So there must be something else that's, that's driving it. Or perhaps there's a liquid ocean under there. Or um, it's much more radioactive than we initially thought. Or perhaps planetary science uh, doesn't work the way that we thought we did. Now, as I understand it, when they were, were reviewing the images, and I'm not sure how much we can pick up from the image behind us, there, were, there was reference to a, a shaded area mm -hmm. w about which w there was some confusion what that might be. Well, on, on the planet. Yes, there's there's kind of two parts of the planet at the bottom half that have really captured people's interest. There's that great white heart, which is very smooth and uh, was recently renamed uh, Tomba Regio after the person who found Pluto. And there's also the two dark regions on either side. Um, and what's really striking is the fact that there's such a marked difference between the light and the dark. And one of the explanations of this is it might be something similar to what happens on a moon of Saturn called Ipetus. Um, it's called thermal differentiation, which is basically two different kinds of ice, are different colours, and they boil off at different temperatures, which means that... And the, the way that that boil-off reacts with the atmosphere, um, how it, the temperature it boils off, it falls back down in some places and not in others, and you get a very marked difference. But... That's just one possible explanation. We won't know for certain um, until we get more data through. How can you tell, or can you tell, what the scale, the, the size... You know, you've seen these images. We, we saw that image there of what looked like, you know, a chain of mountains. How big might they be? How big might that heart shape be? Can you tell? Um, they are currently saying that some of the mountains and the canyons are, are miles deep. Um, 11,000 feet was one of the numbers bandied around, um, which is absolutely massive. Um, and... Again, we're not really sure how they can be that big because things that they're made out of, the ices, should collapse before then. So they must be made of, of rock underneath or something. And so it's one of those things we won't really be able to get to grips with how big the scale of this thing, the topography, until we really get more data back from New Horizons. And, Elizabeth, what, how, much, how much better is this image than what exists before? What, what was the previous best image? Absolutely. It's just leaps and bounds better. Before, all we had was a Hubble image, which was very, very blurry. You could just about make up this entire section of the planet was quite light, this entire section of the planet was really dark. Um, and that's all. And now we're being able to get down to, to about... 50 metres, I think. Which are the images you can see there. Uh, thank you so much for your time yeah. this morning. Nice to see you. Victoria Derbyshire is on at 9.15 this morning on the BBC News channel. Victoria, what have you got for us today?
Hi, good morning. We'll talk to Michael Palin live on the kind of programmes he thinks the BBC should make for you in the future and why he believes a diminished BBC would mean a diminished Britain. Uh, what do you think? Is he right? We'll get the thoughts also of a group of about to qualify hospital doctors on the prospect of being forced to work weekends and ahead of new punishments for repeat knife crime convictions. We'll hear from people who've carried knives. Join us straight after your programme, 9.15, just on the BBC News Channel and online today because the golf is on BBC Two. Victoria, thank you very much. And we have Mike at the golf for us this morning, a report from him coming up very soon. Yes, he's slightly alarmingly been out and about in a buggy. Yeah, he has. And he's also even more alarmingly been allowed to hold a replica of the very famous claret jug. jug. He's been moving around with that. Uh, Business Live is coming up in just a moment on the BBC News Channel. Yeah, and Charlie has been to meet Jake Gyllenhaal. And we will be joined by Joss Stone. After the news, travel and weather, where you are. Good morning. From BBC London News, I'm Catherine Carpenter. New minimum sentences for criminals repeatedly convicted of knife crime are to be brought in. The new two-strike sentence comes into effect tomorrow. It means that adults convicted more than once of being in possession of a blade face between six months and four years in prison. The mother of murdered teenager Stephen Lawrence has called for undercover police officers who spied on justice campaign groups to be named. Doreen Lawrence made the comments as the Home Secretary prepared to outline the scope of a new inquiry into covert policing. It was set up after revelations that Scotland Yard had spied on the Lawrence family. Nine people have been released on bail during what detectives describe as a fast-paced investigation into shooting in Haringey. Two innocent bystanders were hit, one of them was killed. Following the shooting last Friday, six people were arrested at Gatwick and three in Hornsey. The existing visa system doesn't work for London businesses and could threaten economic recovery. That's according to new research from the London Chamber of Commerce and Industry. The report found that over half of London companies struggled to find the skilled staff they required in the UK. But barriers such as the cost and length of the visa process made it difficult to bring workers from overseas. Well, let's take a look at the travel situation now. And we've got a good service on most tube lines this morning. Just minor delays on the Victoria line. It's after a train broke down at Warren Street earlier. This is the A4 into town. It's slow from the M4 elevated section to the Hammersmith flyover. A broken down crane is causing queues on Wandsworth High Street. And on the A4 through Sipson, the traffic lights aren't working at the Bath Road, Sipson Road junction. So there are safety restrictions in place. Now the weather with Elizabeth Rizzini. Hello, good morning. Another rather humid feel to things again today. We're starting off the morning on a very warm note, 18 degrees Celsius already in the centre of town. So very humid. We'll start to get some sunny spells developed through the course of the afternoon, but it is a rather grey start. We've got some mist and some low cloud around this morning, but that will gradually thin and break and we'll start to see some brightness and some sunshine coming through. Now, temperature wise, by the end of the afternoon, we're widely up into the low to the mid 20s, but where we get the most sunshine, we could be looking at highs of 20 27 or even 28 degrees Celsius. Now through the evening we're at risk of seeing a few showers. We could get some heavy downpours, maybe even a flash or two of lightning. Those showers are gradually going to drift their way northwards through the course of the night. Another rather muggy night to follow. Lows of around 17 or 18 degrees Celsius once more. But tomorrow through the day we we'll start to get some fresher air so it's going to feel much more pleasant tomorrow. Much fresher by the time we get to the afternoon. High still into the mid 20s. It's looking dry and there'll be lots of sunshine around as well so a very different feel to things by the time we get to tomorrow and again over the weekend it's looking largely dry and there'll be some lovely spells of sunshine that's all for now but Vanessa Feltz will be on the radio in half an hour she'll be discussing the Home Secretary's decision to refuse the use of water cannon in the capital bye for now Hello, this is Breakfast with Charlie State and Sally Nugent. Time now is 8.30 exactly. A reminder of our main story this morning. Hospital consultants will be forced to work at weekends in the future under government plans to change their contracts. At the moment, they're allowed to opt out of non-emergency care. The Health Secretary, Jeremy Hunt, outlined the proposals here on Breakfast in the last hour. He highlighted research showing that patients are... 15% more likely to die if they're admitted to hospital on a Sunday compared to a Wednesday. It's not a war against consultants. This is supported by the Royal College of Surgeons, the Royal College of Physicians, 
the Royal College of Emergency Medicine, many medical directors who want that sense of vocation and professionalism brought back into the contract. And of course it will take longer to deal with those weekend mortality statistics. But you know, in the end, uh, this is about a, a, a choice we have. We had a terrible tragedy with what happened at Midstaffs. We can try and learn the lessons and move on, or we can do something more ambitious than that. But the doctors' union, the British Medical Association, told doctors told us doctors already work around the clock and took issue with the government's negotiating tactics. We find it hard to understand exactly how the government can be saying consultants need to be forced to work at weekends. We already do. The question is, how do we better work for patients at weekends? And we try to engage with the government continually about how to improve standards. I'd want to carry on that sort of dialogue, and I have to say many doctors and probably a lot of patients will feel quite sad that the government wants to negotiate by ultimatum. Supermarkets have been found to be misleading customers with confusing promotions, according to evidence uncovered by the regulator, the Competition and Markets Authority. Steph is here with the details. We had the CMA on a moment ago, and um, it's quite confusing, isn't it? Yeah, just like the promotions. Uh, yeah, it is quite confusing, because basically the, the CMA have, have done this review over the last three months.